Thank you, Father Gregory, and dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Divine Providence has blessed us who are in Ann Arbor. The Lord has seen our struggles, he knows our sufferings, and he has blessed us with a heavenly intercessor who knows our pain because he himself has entered through it. Tertullian says that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And truly, the, blood of the, the ground of Ann Arbor has been planted with the blood of willing martyrdom, of a suffering life for the sake of Christ, and that is Mardari of Ann Arbor and Libertyville. Okay, friends, listen, I'm exhausted. I was here every morning and every night. I have zero views left. No talking. Well, Thank you. I will record you and we'll play that on YouTube. So, please. I'm also very loud and can overpower this microphone, but that's quite all right. So St. Mardari of Libertyville in Ann Arbor was born on November 2nd, 1889 in Coronet in Lesiani County in Montenegro to Petar and Yela Uskokovic. They were the uh, local clans leaders. They were a very prominent family from whom many bishops and many civil leaders arose in Serbia. He was baptized in the parish church with the name of Ivan. From his youth, he greatly desired to serve the Lord. He made it clear to his parents at the age of 11 that he wanted to become a monk. He did this in two ways. The first way was he wrote a letter to the Patriarch of Serbia requesting to be tonsured a monk. The, the Patriarch told him that he would need to get an education. So he went to his brother at the age of 11 and said, come, let us go serve the church together, and they ran away. They did not make it very far. They may, possibly made it to the outskirts of the city before they realized what had happened, chased them down, and brought them back. So his desires were not realized at that time, and yet this seeking to serve the Lord in his church never truly went away. After some patience and submitting to the will of his parents, he finally convinced them to allow him to, take, to become a student in Belgrade, in um, the capital of Serbia, in order to, through education, learn how to better serve the church and ultimately enter into his desire to serve the Lord. He came to Belgrade at the age of 15 and became a monk in the Sutenica Monastery. He was ordained a hierodeacon by the Patriarch, and he was sent to Russia for education in 1905. While in Belgrade, it was there that St. Mardari came to the realization that this, the world was not for him. It was loud, it was bustly, there was too many things going on. And so while in the world, while in his education, he found his comfort in the church. He spent much of his time outside of his studies at the cathedral in Belgrade, attending the services every morning and every evening, and whenever he had time in between, he was in the church. It was at this time, and with this formation, this spiritual life that he was cultivating, that his desire to enter into monasticism turned from a simple sentiment into a firm conviction. St. Mardari says that even when I was a boy in Montenegro, vague thoughts of monasticism would sometimes work their way up to the surface of my mind. Now these thoughts began to take a definitive form of a resolution. So he first moved towards this through attending the services and through establishing a regular prayer rule. So upon resolving to become a monk, he left the city proper and traveled on foot to the monastery in Studenica on the day of the presentation of the Virgin, the day before his birthday in 1905. He did not tell anyone in the world that he did this. According to his parents, they thought that he had died out of misfortune because he had so desired to renounce the world and serve the church, he even abandoned his own family. He became a monk on March 19th, 1906, taking the name Mardare. He placed himself under the spiritual care of an elder there, the monk named Andre. He was a peasant in the world who was struck with blindness and bore his infirmity with patience and humility through monasticism. When St. Mardari first met him, he snuck into his cell late at night and heard him saying the Jesus prayer and doing prostrations for hours. This was a very old man, and this was something that greatly impressed him. And he was resolved that this was the person under whom he would place his monastic formation. This was a very formative period for the saints. They spent many hours... Uh, sleepless nights, reading the lives of the saints, studying the scriptures, and learning the prayer of the heart, that is the Jesus prayer. St. Mardari says this is one of the most important um, times in his life in which he was learned the spiritual life of the church, which would prepare him for his future sufferings. <clears throat> Soon after his tonsure, he was ordained a hierodeacon by Metropolitan Sava of Zicha, and he was only 15 years old, so very young. And even then, the hierarchy of the church saw in St. Mardarian a very prominent uh, person, a very important figure who would be of good use to the church. 
He had resolved at this time to spend the rest of his life in the Studenica Monastery, but, as he says, the eyes of the higher Serbian clergy and the person of the, its bishops turned in my direction. It was decided that I should be given the opportunity to acquire a special higher education in theology. For this purpose, I was to be sent all the way to Russia. So in this, he denied his will and submitted to the will of the bishops. Having desired to spend his entire life in the monastery in repentance, he chose to submit to the bishops. Now at that time in Stutenica, there was only two uh, monastics who were hierodeacons. It was St. Mardarie and another whose name we don't know. But upon leaving, the second um, hierodeacon, who was very upset that he would be taking the entire service uh, load of the monastery upon himself, which was extensive, told him that if he even became a priest, he would be dead to him. And if he became a bishop, he certainly would pray for him, but it would be praying for his enemies. Another elder at the monastery said, Mardarie, if you become a bishop, when you return to Studenica, I will allow you to ride my back around the monastery. In other words, saying, it's not going to happen, Mardarie. It's not going to happen. And so he, in his humility, embraced the scorn with love for his brother monks, prayed for them, and left for Russia. So this was one and a half years after entering into the monastery of Studenica. So he was, at, he was 16 years old at this time. St. Mardari arrived in Moscow by train and went straight to the Serbian representation church at the Kremlin where he was to serve Vespers, according to the Tsar. He was struck with his surprise to find the church, which he expected to be full of Serbs, was actually full of Russians, was full of Ukrainians, full of Bulgarians. All different Slavic peoples were there to meet him, to meet this new person from Serbia who was serving. And he came to recognize this bond between all Slavic peoples was clearly expressed with a common liturgical language. This bond, which he recognized, was a bond in a common cultural heritage, which is... Christianity. All Slavs have one thing that unites them, which is Christ. And he saw this as the strongest, greatest gift which was given to the Serbian er, and all the Slavic peoples by the Greeks. So in August of 1907, the Moscow Synod informed St. Mardari of his appointment of his appointment to the Volnia Theological Seminary and tried to place him on a fast track through the program which he resisted. How, and, and he received support in this through the head of the uh, seminary there at the time, which was Metropolitan Anthony Kropovitsky. For those of you who don't know, he was the first, first hierarch of Rokor, and he was one of the greatest supporters in this time of St. Mardadi. St. Mardadi uh, spoke very highly of Metropolitan Anthony and said that it was very nice in his time to get to know one of the great saints of the church. And he prayed for him throughout his life. Even in the United States, he spoke very highly of Metropolitan Anthony, of blessed memory. So the church accepted his request to not be fast-tracked through this program because he desired to go through from the very beginning, um, which was essentially grade school through uh, you know, college. And it and allowed him to go through this full program despite his age and his clerical status. His time in Zietomir uh, left a very strong impression on the resolve of the Russian spirituality, recalling the legend of priests being swallowed up in the walls of the Hagia Sophia, who will reappear when the great church is returned to Christians to resume the liturgy interrupted by the Muslims. St. Mardari says that it is just so with the faith of the Russian people. It lies safely hidden behind the walls of their hearts, ready to come forth from its brightness, undimmed, when the time shall have passed. Nor do I believe that we shall have to wait six centuries for this to happen. He said this, he wrote this, after he had fled Russia, after he had fled the Bolshevik Revolution and saw the great persecution of Christians. And truly, this was a prophetic word from him, because we see the state of the Russian church today, uh, which has overcome uh, the, the godless Bolshevik regime, and through its witness today, uh, proclaims Christ to the world. This present state of the Russian church truly validates this saying by St. Mardadi. His love for Russia was because of its orthodox faith, because of the faith of the Russian people, which united them to himself. He saw in Russian spirituality an unwavering fidelity to Christ, which he himself desired to emulate as well in his life. In 1908, he moved to the Kishinev Seminary, and he was ordained a hieromonk in that same year. So he was, um, he was very young. He was, I believe, 18 years old. Uh, he was requested to serve at that time in a parish church about 25 miles from the seminary. Uh, this was a profound moment for him as he was exposed to Russian peasants for the first time. He later recognized the great piety of the Russian people as something that would not be broken by the Bolsheviks. He saw this as that very thing which the Bolsheviks would never be able to take away and which would overcome their tyranny, which it did. 
His theological education ended in St. Petersburg in 1916, and he was a part of the 1917-18 All-Russian Council. He lived in Russia until 1917, eventually fleeing because of, because of the Bolshevik Revolution. He writes of this time in great detail in his memoirs titled Incomprehensible Russia, which is available in the Parish Bookstore. So if you wish to read more about his time in Russia, please pick up that book. I will not focus so much on this. Um, I believe, how many copies are there? Albina and, and uh, Svetlana know there's like two or three more copies left. Very good book, very important book. Uh, it's, it's his memoirs of his time a while in Russia. So he fled Russia and went to where? He came to America. In 1917, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church sent St. Mardotti to, or to America to organize a sizable Serbian population in North America under the Russian Church. This was one of the decisions of the All-American Council. They sent him both to organize the Serbs and also to get him out of Dodge because they recognized what was going on. Uh, the Bolsheviks were closing in on St. Petersburg. They saw that there was a need to get him into a safe place, so they sent him to America. The Russian Metropolitan in America desired to elect him a bishop in 1919, but since he was a cleric of the Serbian Orthodox Church and was only on loan to the Moscow Patriarchate, he desired to follow good canonical order, and so he wished to seek the consent of the Serbian Orthodox Church. He returned to Serbia, and when he requested, they said, well, we'll think about it, but we'll have you uh, run a monastery and a seminary while you're here. And so they actually kept him at this monastery for a few years, where he ended up completely transforming the spiritual life of the monastery, which had become very lax, and created a very strong seminary community uh, at this place. And so his success, even in Serbia, even against his will, was very much uh, well known. After this time, through the uh, intercessions of, of St. Nikolai Vilmirovic, who was the administrator of the diocese in America, uh, he was sent by the Serbian Orthodox Church to be his secretary and to help him administer the diocese. They had asked St. Nikolai who would be the best person to run the diocese, and he said, I need St. Mardari. I need St. Mardari. He is the only one who can do this. On December 1st, 1923, St. Mardari was appointed the administrator of the newly formed diocese after St. Nikolai returned to Belgrade. It was at this time that he bought land to establish St. Sava Monastery in Libertyville with his own personal funds. And this is a very common theme throughout his life. His money, he recognized, was not his own. It went to others. His charity was so well known in Russia, for example, that all of his clothes came from bishops who took pity on him because he was in rags, because he wouldn't purchase his own clothes. And if they gave him clothes, he would simply give them away again. So at one point, Metropolitan Anthony had to force him to promise him that he wouldn't get rid of his winter coat that he gave him. And so he ended up promising. And that was the only thing he kept with him. It was the only thing he brought to America was that winter coat from Metropolitan Anthony. So in, in September 3rd of 1923, St. Mardari served at the first liturgy in the field of the property that would be known today as St. Sava Monastery, which is about a five-hour drive from here, Father? Yeah, it's just north of Chicago. Right up 94. So you can see St. Mardari if you tra travel 94, or in about five hours, just north of Chicago. The building of St. Sava Monastery proved to be an incredibly difficult task for the saints. This was one of the requests that St. Nikolai gave him. He gave him two requests. It was to build a monastery that would be the spiritual heart of the Serbian people in America and to organize the diocese, to bring order to the Serbs here because there was a lot of chaos, which we'll talk about later on. This was an incredibly difficult task. He was severely stricken with tuberculosis at this time, and he faced great resistance among the faithful, who saw his vision for the monastery as overly ambitious and at times financially irresponsible. These criticisms were also echoed by some of, echoed by some of his own clergy, who could not recognize the illumined saint's desire for the betterment of his flock. They were too focused on, on physical things. They couldn't see the spiritual need of this monastery. In the life of St. Mardarie, it says that his attitude towards his persecutors and slanderers was the best testimony of his authentically Christ-like being. At the insolent accusations of some individuals about the supposed misappropriation of resources, he smiled with sadness and within himself whispered a prayer following in the way of the Lord, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The struggles of St. Mardarie faced or the struggles that St. Mardarie faced are similar to our own as we ourselves struggle to establish a school and build a new church. So may we have his prayers in these endeavors. 
Despite the persecutions he faced, he never enacted revenge on those who criticized him, and there were many. Instead, he shut himself up in his cell and he weeped fervently for those who criticized him. The saint struggled often to obtain funds for the project and would donate from his own modest income. This led to the saying, Mardarie is building a monastery while starving to death. He was wasting away due to tuberculosis. He also, in an attempt to save money for the monastery, would take on much of the manual labor on his own. He would ride a bicycle with a little basket where he would carry bricks from Chicago all the way to the monastery. And he would be seen by many of his faithful riding this bicycle, a frail young man, blood pouring out of his chest due to the tuberculosis, and then laying the bricks himself. And they would ask him to stop, and he would say, well, who is going to lay these bricks? Who is here? It is just me. And so he would lay these bricks, he would, he would plant trees. All of the trees on the property are planted by St. Mardotti himself. Many of the bricks that were laid in the church were laid by himself. He truly put himself into that church through his blood and his sweat and his labors. So his role as an administrator in the diocese, which is a second challenge, was also a great struggle for him. As St. Mardarie had to consolidate the Serbian clergy in North America who had been previously operating either directly under a hierarch from Serbia, but not a hierarch in America, or under canonically dubious means. Through much suffering, he was able to consolidate them and establish order in the diocese, bringing them all under St. Nikolai. There existed a great neglect of the canonical order in those days amongst not only the various Serbian parishes, but amongst all of the churches at that time. The greatest issue was that of what's called parasynagogues, which are, according to the canons of St. Basil the Great, gatherings held by insubordinate presbyters or bishops and those held by uneducated laities. It was common for Serbian cultural societies to form and for the laity there to establish a parish without Episcopal blessing and sometimes even find a priest to serve them all without the blessing of a bishop. St. Mardari, commenting on this frequently, would go to these gatherings and say the church is the body of Christ and yet without the bishop there is no church. So he would bring them into good order by bringing them under the bishop of this region. As we celebrated recently the memory of St. Ignatius of Antioch, he, remem he reminds us frequently that without the bishop, there is no church. Without the bishop, there is no sacramental life. Without the bishop, Christ cannot be found because we must all gather in good order under the one body as established by Christ in the bishop. So... The, the fundamental way that he combated this, uh, this chaos was by requesting a number of antimesian, which is the cloth that rests on the altar. It is the cloth on which we serve the liturgy. In it is a document. It basically says, it's, it's written by the bishop that says, I bless you to serve the church at this appointed place. And then it has in it stitched the relics of the martyrs. This is the sign in which you can serve the liturgy without an antimens. You cannot serve the liturgy. And so this was his way to combat it, was to remind the people that they had to have an antimens from the hierarch of that region. So this was uh, the fundamental sign that the church would operate in good standing in the local church as opposed to a parasynagogue. On December 7th, 1925, he was elected bishop by the Diocese of the Serbian Orthodox Church, and he was consecrated the following year on Palm Sunday at the age of 36. St. Mardari arrived in New York to an excited reception of Serbs, genu generally surprised at the demeanor of their first bishop. One said they expected a despot, but they saw a lamb of God. They saw before them a frail man who was full of grace and full of great asceticism, who desired nothing more than to serve the people, to offer himself up. As we say in the Traparian of today, he willingly ascended the cross. He willingly ascended the cross of his suffering for the sake of his people. He himself denied his will, died to himself, and fought for the good of his people in America. All while this, he was doing this, he was severely ill, and he never ceased to labor for the good of his people, <clears throat> establishing numerous churches in the first year of his episcopacy and visiting all of the parishes who requested his presence. His doctors were driven mad by this, driven mad by the fact that he simply would not rest, he would not do what he needed to do in order to uh, treat his tuberculosis, which at the time was incurable. Uh, and, and so his doctors, as a result of this, relinquished all responsibility for his health after seeing that he simply would not rest so long as his diocese was in need of a shepherd and in need of good order. One chronicler went so far as to say that the cause of St. Margari's death would be his disorderly clergy, who were the cause of scandal and for whom he labored tirelessly. 
The saint, with great struggle, established order amongst his clergy and sought to promote unity in his diocese even until his last breath and after his last breaths. While severely stricken with illness, the saint did not cease to celebrate the divine services with great attention and care. One testimony about the nativity in 1932 recounts that, due to severe weather, none of the parish clergy of the Church of the Resurrection in Chicago were able to attend. So St. Mardari served alone for the handful of faithful who made the effort to attend the services. He arrived at the church in bitter cold, which is something that severely uh, flares up tuberculosis. Once again, chest covered in blood, and it soaked through his vestments during the service. And yet he continued to serve because he said, if I do not serve, then the people will have no service, and I have failed them. So he could not bear even the thought of resting for a little while and denying the people the services. St. Mardari labored so strenuously because of his faith in the resurrection. He wrote, I rejoice to you as your bishop. I rejoice with you even though I am physically sick because I believe that there is no death, knowing that I will live even after that hour when I depart this earth. Among all the duties that a man can have, there is no greater duty, which I would like to remind you on this day of the resurrection, than the duty of love. This is the duty of all duties. This is from his Paschal Epistle of 1927. St. Mardari taught the faithful the Orthodox faith through his very life and his sufferings. It is through his ascent to his cross, it is through his willing martyrdom that the crucifixion of Christ was made present to all around him. The teaching and dogma of the Church about the Holy Trinity and her ethos was preached by Bishop Madari's most or mostly through his authentic Christian life and the sign of the cross by being crucified for those around him. He also was very well known as a phenomenal orator. Many of his uh, homilies were published in Russia. I'm not sure if they survived the Bolshevik Revolution. I, I don't know if any of them are in English today. I know we have some of them in, in a book, but uh, not all of them. So on September 6th, 1931, St. Sava Monastery Temple was consecrated, that very monastery in which he began to labor for when he first moved here. After eight years of struggle to accomplish that which many doubted possible, at times the saint was even seen while struggling with tuberculosis, laying bricks, uh, laying pavement, doing, putting, planting trees, doing all the things that he should not have been doing, at least according to worldly eyes, and yet he knew what this meant and what this church would be for, for the people. It was for the betterment of his people, and so he was willing to die for it. Also, that number, eight years, is a very um, important number for us to, to note because, you know, these things take time. Often we say, oh, we're going to build a church. Well, what do we have to do first? Um, why is the church not here yet? Why are we not in the new building? Why are we not? This was what the people were asking St. Mardotti, and they were asking, why are you planting trees when you need to be building the church? Why are you laying pavement when you need to build a church? So we have a parking lot, we have a cemetery we've all built, and people keep asking, why is there no church? It's because these things take time, and the saint recognized this, and he endured all of these criticisms, all of these struggles and hardships with patience, knowing that ultimately all of this would be necessary for that church to come. And to this day, this church is a monument of his labor for the Serbian people. It is a very beautiful church, and if you get an opportunity, I strongly recommend you attend. Um, you can see his relics there, and it is a very wonderful place. So St. Mardari, after struggling for a very long time with tuberculosis, uh, finally ended up in the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. While he was writing his nativity epistle on December 12th, 1935, he reposed at the age of, or at, at the age of 46 years old. He died while he lived with great care of his flock, praying for all of those around him and writing for their sakes. His friend and co-worker, priest uh, Zivoyin Ristanovic, I don't know Serbian, was with him on the last day of his life. When he arrived in the hospital, he witnessed the saint praying a prayer of his own. He said, Receive, O Heavenly Father, me thy servant. Forgive me my sins. Have mercy on my people, my spiritual children. Keep them by thy might. O Lord, bow down thine ear and hear the cry of the orphans of my brother Stano, the one who he tried to drag to go to school when he was many years ago. Have mercy on all of us and worthy ones. Save and have mercy on the Serbian Orthodox people, on our royal house, and all the Orthodox Christians. Forgive me, O God, as I do forgive everybody. Everybody. Amen. And he said this prayer repeatedly for about 24 hours, and he continued to pray, and he continued to seek the goodwill of those who were around him. And he continued to pray even for those who wounded him in this time. And the priest stayed with him, read the prayers for the repose while he continued to say this prayer and say this prayer and pray earnestly for all those around him. He reposed 
that day on December 12th at 9.45 p.m. At the time of his death, he, as a 46-year-old man, only weighed 70 pounds. His body wasted away from his tireless service in spite of his illness. The doctor said that it was because of the hardship of his life, because of his mode of life, that his body was so wasted away, because he would not rest for the sake of his flock. St. Mardari's funeral was held at St. Sava Monastery on December 18th. At the funeral, his last will and testament was read, in which he requested the elevation of 11 priests to proto-presbyter, along with various awards. These 11 priests were well known to be his greatest slanderers and opponents in his apostolic ministry. So even in death, he sought to instill unity in his diocese, just as he did in his life, and sought to reconcile even with those who tried to stab him in the back. So Bishop Mardari, as it says in his life, was and remained a pauper. For this reason, the kingdom of Yugoslavia paid for the expenses of the burial of the first bishop of America and Canada. Having come from an illustrious family, St. Mardari forsook all of his wealth to serve the church in America and to establish a foundation that would long outlive him. It is said that he built himself into St. Sava's foundation, and the Serbian church to this day is indebted to the saint in ways still being revealed. St. Mardari is an icon of patience and suffering. Having endured vicious illness, slander, and outright rebellion for much of his ministry, he sought the gospel commands unfailingly on behalf of his beloved flock. Our Lord said in, his, in the gospel according to Luke that there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. The saint did this throughout his entire life. He forsook his family through entering into monasticism. He forsook his status through seeking the low path of Christ. And he even forsook his own health for the sake of the people because he recognized their needs as far greater than his own and trusted in the resurrection and knew that this life is not the end, but rather the beginning. So he must have a good life in order to have a good eternal life. St. Mardari's relics were attempted to be uncovered on May 4th, 2017, in preparation for his glorification. However, upon the removal of the floor, which was it was in a cement crypt, it was revealed that his casket was entirely sealed in concrete. So the, the people then piously, well, did very similar to St. John of Shanghai, except um, sealed in concrete. So the, the people who were all vested and prepared to do this work very piously brought out their power tools and began cutting at the concrete, just as the people in San Francisco, fully vested, very piously brought out their crowbars and power tools and worked at the saint's coffin. Um, the following day, a work crew came and unsealed the crypt. While lifting the lid, it slipped and broke the casket, completely shattering the section where his head should have been and at the same time releasing a sweet-smelling fragrance like that of myrrh. It was then, in their terror that they had just crushed the head of their first bishop, that they discovered that he had been buried facing the wrong direction. He had been buried facing west, which is very, very, it's very entertaining. Um, had he been buried facing east, as his custom, his relics would have been completely destroyed as a result of their attempt to free him um, and, as, and in spite of that, you know, he, his body only in, incurred minor damage upon pulling him out. So it was discovered that from his waist up, his relics were incorrupt. They looked the very same as they did the day they buried him, nearly a century before. St. Mardari was glorified as a saint on July 23rd of that year in 2017. Uh, the service was celebrated by Patriarch Yodene of blessed memory and numerous hierarchs, including our own Archbishop Peter, and I believe, Reader Michael, you were there, right? So there's a few people here who were there as well. So there's a lot that we can take away from the life of this saint. You know, I wrote this, when I wrote, when I wrote this talk, this was in December, so a lot more has happened and a lot more can be discussed on what we can take away. But I'll focus on what I wrote here and we can also add a few extra things. So we as a parish have a saint whose struggles are very much like our own. God in his providence has blessed us and with someone who knows how to guide us and who we can look to as a eminent light on that royal path to Christ to guide us into the heavenly kingdom. His struggle to build St. Salva's monastery matches very much our own attempts to build our own church. In the face of illness, he did not cease to pursue the gospel commands of Christ. We too, in the face of the pandemic's over, over. I'm not going to talk about that. So he pursued unity in spite of many offenses. So 
So many people in his life sought to slander the saint, sought to speak out against the saint, sought to fight him tooth and nail with what he was doing because they held on to what they thought should be done right, because they held on to what they thought would be the right thing to do, and they couldn't get over the fact that somebody else saw something greater than themselves. So as a result of this, his clergy slandered him. They cursed and mocked and rebelled against him, including as well, much of his flock. How did he respond to this numerous injustices with sorrowful prayer for the sake of those who wronged him, never seeking vengeance, instead blessing those who persecuted him? In our age of division and strife, we too must be fulfill the gospel command to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which, which despitefully use you and persecute you. As well, we can look at St. Mardari's Slavic ideal, this pan-Slavic unity that he saw as a union in Christ in today's current struggles. We have here an intercessor who recognized the unity of Slavic peoples so long as they are pursuing Christ, and we can entreat him to help us in our current struggles with this war that is going on to pray that these two brothers may be one in Christ as they are called to be. So I will leave you with a piece from one of his Paschal epistles. He says, Today's modern mankind has deluded itself into thinking that it will solve the heaviest and most complicated problems of life as long as individuals and the entire humanity do not accept Christ as Luke and Cleopas accepted him to eat with them. And as long as they do not believe that he is their Lord and leader, their eyes will not be opened and they will not exit the darkness, which has enveloped them so quick, so thickly. Without him, they will wander around like a ship without a helm or a compass around the stormy sea of life. Without Christ, a terrible shipwreck awaits humanity. Individuals and the entire humanity will see far worse days and blessings and happiness will fly away from humanity as a bird flies away from its abandoned nest. Your house is left to you desolate, says the Lord. So through the prayers of St. Mardari of Ann Arbor, <coughs> may we learn to, learn to lock, walk in the law of God and endure the many trials and temptations we face as a parish family and as a church in the world. Amen. Is there any questions? Okay, any, any questions for Father Colin? Do we have anybody named Mardari in the parish? My son. That's right. He's the first Mardari since Mar St. Mardari died here in Ann Arbor. Other, any questions for Father Colin? That's what happens when you can't think of a name for a saint. Father Gregory will name one for you. Yes. Maybe I missed this. Is the St. Sava Monastery? Where is the St. Sava Monastery? St. Sava Monastery is in Libertyville, Illinois. It is right off 94. So if you just take 94, as Father Joseph always said, 94 goes all the way to Fargo, so you know where Father Joseph lives, which probably was against his wishes, but the halfway point is St. Saba Monastery in Illinois, so if you wish to go see Father Joseph, because he can't escape us, because he told us where he lives, drive 94, and halfway, ask St. Mardari to pray for you, that he may soften Father Joseph's heart when you arrive unexpected, and bring him great joy, knowing that you have arrived unexpected. So, I don't know why you were all laughing. What year did you Nineteen thirty-five, I believe. Let me look back here. While you're doing that, Father Vladimir had a question. Uh, it's not a question; it's just a uh, you know, kind of thought, comment on uh, the the sermon he gave on. Uh, you said an Easter egg. Yeah. So he he uh, mentioned darkness, and uh, you said that he was he died in nineteen thirty-five. Thirty-five. And that's the time when Nazi Germany was just, you know, growing and uh, getting more popular around the world, actually. And many people here in this country, they thought Hitler was a great man. Mm -hmm. So when he was uh, talking about darkness, I'm sure he, so many people um, did not understand the, the difference between darkness and light. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people were sleeping. And uh, we, we uh, discussed his, uh, you know, uh, why did he become a saint? I think he became a saint because he woke up people around him. He woke up uh, people who were sleeping and were in darkness and could not uh, distinguish between darkness and light. And that's why he uh, struggled. And, and I think he achieved that. The monasteries have kind of... The other of that evidence. Mm -hmm. 
Other comments or questions? I, while you're while you're thinking about that, I can tell you that I was speaking with one of our Serbian brother priests. Uh, actually, he is, uh, is the secretary of Bishop Longin, just like I'm the secretary of Bishop Peter. And he told me that the Serbs used to use North America as like a place for outcasts. So whatever whatever priest was like a big troublemaker wherever in Serbia, he got a one way ticket to America. And so that that's what Father that's what's Father Mardari, later Saint Mardari, got when he came here. All the priests that they didn't want to deal with in Serbia, they sent here, right? So that hopefully gives you some context. I mean, Serbs are very stubborn and can be difficult people, but those were special people uh, that even they didn't want to deal with, and they sent them to North America. So um, that's why he had so much trouble. Priests are also problematic in general. So. Yes, in general, that's true. It was the priest that crucified Christ. Other questions or comments for Father? So we will have um, um, his relics coming. God willing, we're trying to find a date for Archbishop Peter and Bishop Longin to come and serve together with us. Bishop Longin told me that he will bring the relics of Saint Mardari for us. And Vladika Peter made a, an exception. He doesn't like relics in parish churches. He says that relics are for, that go between bishops; they stay in cathedrals. But he said since Mar Saint Mardari died here, that he'll bless us to have the relics. I don't think I mentioned in my talk, but I'm sure Father Gregory's mentioned it plenty of times. Once we build the new church, this will be renamed St. Mardari. So this will be St. Mardari's church in Ann Arbor. So. This, this temple here. And with the blessing of uh, Patriarch Irini, who thought that was such a good idea that he, he blessed it. Other questions? Comments? Is, is the, uh, our new uh, school... Academy. Saint Mardari is the patron saint of the academy, uh, with Archbishop Peter's blessing. We do have a, a icon of him here, which if Alex will just step to one side, we have we can let people see. Uh, but the school board has arranged for a new icon uh, to be painted of Saint Mardari, one that's never been painted uh, before, of him working in the library. He was such a scholar. Uh, he he was really he's really the perfect kind of patron saint for a school. Uh, and that, in fact, is done. Uh, the icon has, has arrived and will soon be in the church. Uh, we need to take some super high quality uh, pictures of it so we can make prints. Uh, but once that's done, it'll be blessed and it'll be by Pascha. It should be here in the church. Jack. So if you want to uh, follow the St. Madari's pathway, then the church school, which he's going to be the patron saint of, you can always use the help. I mean, here he was with the Moses. Bleeding out, basically. And he built that church, the monastery here. We can emulate him by doing it here in honor of him also. And we won't even make you use a bicycle. You could probably use your car for the bridge. Right, Jack? Or do we want to go with the pure authentic? We even have power tools. Well, if you have upset Father Gregory or Father Collins, you might have to ride a bicycle for a week. <laughs> I'll lend you one of my bicycles. Very good. Euphemia had a question. Um, I was just going to ask if you finished completing the church before you died. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was consecrated only, I think, six years before he died. He did not, so he accomplished everything he sought out to accomplish, but only got to experience the fruit of that for maybe three years, and then he died. Um, so he, he did exactly what, what St. Nic Nikolai told him to do, establish order in the diocese, which took him until his dying breath. And even after his dying breath, he established order, and he completed the, the construction of the monastery. So That would be another good uh, pilgrimage. Absolutely. Uh, not, not, not far at all. Was it an accident that they buried him facing the wrong way? Did you hear what she said, Father? Was it an accident that they buried him facing the wrong way? <laughs> not entirely sure how to answer that. It's the I, Serbian way. I would say that... <laughs> They made a mistake by God's grace, because if they would have done it right, then his head would have been crushed when, when they, they, they took him out from his grave. What's Serbs are an illumined people. Somehow they, do, they, they do things we don't understand, and yet they're right. That they don't understand also. Um, what's interesting is whoever made these uh, sarcophagus, sarcophagi in, uh, at, at St. Sabas was not good at it. Because when St. Nicholas Velimidovich, that was here before St. Mardari and gave him all those instructions, he was also very dead. And also when they went to take him out from his grave, 
it also fell down on him. And he was also f facing the wrong way. So somebody had really a very blessed confusion around that time, and it worked. Uh, because, but that was so destroyed. His sarcophagus was so destroyed that even though officially his relics are in um, Zicha, where he came from, I happen to know that there's quite a bit of his relics still left there because they just couldn't remove them because of the way that the thing collapsed. So uh, he was bishop uh, here in America and the Lord blessed him to uh, stay with us even if officially he's there. And he also was a very prominent homilist as well. Many of his homilies are in English, St. Nikolai. Very, very important saint. He was blessed to participate in that famous Paschal Divine Liturgy in Dachau. I don't know if probably some people know about it, but maybe others don't. Um, during that time, many Slavs, of course, the, the Nazis uh, didn't like Slavs either, and so there were lots of Slavs in the camps, uh, and they used Dachau as a camp mostly for Slavs. Um, and so there were a lot of uh, Orthodox clergy there. And as uh, Pascha was, was approaching, they decided that they couldn't go without serving Pascha. So they would steal like towels and other things and they began to make them into the vestments that they would need. Um, you know, like for a deacon, an orarian, and for a bishop, a uh, amafor, all of that stuff. They even made priest vestments from the stuff that they stole. Apparently the Germans were not very observant. Anyway, uh, and to get wine, uh, it used to be that in the Red Cross packets you got raisins. So they took the raisins and they soaked them in water and hid them from the from the guards, like way under their bunks, so nobody could find it. Very, very interesting. They served the entire possible service, not just the liturgy, the entire thing by memory. Because of course the Germans didn't say, "Here, have your books; it's Pascha," and they did it in the dark because they had to serve it without the guards knowing. So he was there and he participated in that that liturgy. Other questions, comments? All right, we'll leave it with that. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, Father. One more round of applause.